Let's see a properly cut nut. Stay in tune. In fact, you can go back as far as you can too with that. Get your Jeff back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. Yeah. There it is. There's the chord. There's the chord. I can die now. Trust is at the top, right? Yep. How long was that project in, in play for the this one. for the sure. Lurks Head? How long was that project in play for the, Lur the Lurks Head? Uh, before we released it, um, probably a year, maybe a year eighteen months or so. In development. Yeah, yeah. I'm really happy with it. You know, uh, and like the guitars, it's. You know, if you're going to put your name on something, mm -hmm. I think it has to be it has to be the best that, yeah. that you can come up with. Absolutely. It's really, really important. Even if it's not your real name. <laughs> Even if it's not your real name. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's something to think well, about. Well, it's yeah. sort of my real fake name, <laughs> <laughs> my nickname. Hey guys, this is Ross and Ryan here in Montreal. We're thrilled to get to talk with Alex Lifeson here at the Godin headquarters about his career, his writing, and most importantly, his new Lurks Limelight guitar. We hope you enjoy. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. We really appreciate it. Yeah. It's been a long day already, but uh, it's yeah. definitely no, worth it. No, it's exciting. It's two years of working on this project to get to this point. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Well, let's get right into it then. So we're all familiar with the sportscaster. All us, right. you know, Rush nerds are, are familiar with that. And for me, it seemed to encapsulate a time in your playing where you went from kind of a heavier, more blues-based based approach, and then you became a much more lyrical player. And yeah. I'm, I could be off base, but it seems to me like that kind of guitar was, it lent itself to that style of playing, something you were morphing into more so in the early 80s. Is that, am I yeah. even close to reality? Or? So I, I was always a humbucker guy, yep. and uh, I got a Strat as just a, a backup guitar, and, for, and just for a little bit of a different character, in, in recordings and things like that. And I found that I didn't really play it much on the road. I had my 335 and I had a couple less poles. Uh, and I didn't really play the, the Fender. And I thought, well, why is that? Because uh, it doesn't have a humbucker in it for what I wanted at the time. So the original guitar, which was a, a, a black sort of sportscaster, uh, I, I put the humbucker in myself. I've got some great photographs that Finn Costello took back in the 70s of me being in the dressing rooms in, in the UK, cutting the, the uh, pick guard and you know, installing the pickup and all of that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I loved the fact that the, those single coils were so different from the humbuckers. So you had that really amazing clarity and mm -hmm. chiminess, right. but the depth and power of the humbucker. Uh, and it had uh, the vibrato arm on it. When the Floyd Rose, Rose was available, we put that in. And I started to incorporate that more in my playing uh, around that time. The timing was, was really perfect for introducing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that guitar was great. And I used it on, um, uh, on Free Will, in fact, that original one. I had to build a second one, you know, to have a backup. Mm -hmm. So uh, Venom and Music a Company in the States built that second one uh, for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and that had the Bill Lawrence pickup in it and um, the Floyd Rose, the whole thing. And I used that on Limelight, hence Limelight. And this is sort of the uh, replication of that, that guitar. Right. And then that followed with another one. They built a custom one with, with, with the red finish right. for uh, Grace Under Pressure, which has become Grace that I used in a video that we shot in London for uh, just an early warning from Grace Under Pressure. Right. It was called the Dew guitar, right, for a bit? D-E-W? I've heard it being referenced yeah, to as? Yeah, yeah. Just an early warning guitar. Right. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so that's sort of the history of where the original designs came from. Right. Uh, but I always thought it would, would be great because this is a guitar that that I I really loved. I designed, it had everything that I wanted at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, a really good solid platform with clarity in those other pickups 
with the vibrato. For, like, yeah, the chiming kind of arpeggio stuff that you yeah, do. Yeah, you know, you know I do tough. so much of that. And, yeah, you fill in that space. Yeah, and it's a very dynamic change. Like in, in Limelight, for example, going from the verses, which are chunky rock and roll mm-hmm. sort of verses, mm-hmm. into the, you know, the sweet bridge, uh, the, the really clear arpeggios, really, uh, really underlines the mood of the song, the loneliness. You can, you know, if you even strip the lyrics from that song, you can you can hear the message of what's going on with it. Yeah. It's very moving. I I think that's the most important thing in songwriting. Agreed. You know, you're it you're, you're you. trying to create a mood that support whatever the lyrics are. Mm-hmm. And uh, if it's something dark and and uh, sad, you're not going to write big happy chords. Hmm. And you might, you might, <laughs> but uh, but certainly in Russia's music, that was the way we looked at it. We tried to be very cinematic about. The writing and how we assembled parts and it's funny you say because we were from. I was so as a kid I used to listen to Exit Stage Left and when I would hear like you know Jacob's Ladder or Xanadu I mean literally it sounded cinematic to me there was some yeah. sort of kind of theme to it well before the lyrics ever came in right and and so did you write that music and then you know the lyrics came after or was it something that you heard some you saw some lyrics and you thought ooh I have an idea or how did that usually work well you know Neil wrote all the lyrics right. Um, I think probably in the early days, it was a balance between what we were writing musically, the Getty and I were writing musically, sure. and what he was writing. It's, you know, it never was any particular uh, uh, procedure, so the way that happened. Sometimes yeah. the lyrics Anything came goes. we worked to, and sometimes it was the opposite. Later on, I think Getty and I wrote more to his lyrics. Mm. We always had one or two songs where we started with the music and then fitted lyrics to it, but uh, more so we were working to what the the lyrics were providing so that we get a sense of where we were going musically but uh it, it, certainly earlier on it it didn't go really either way in any particular order mm. so i'm intrigued tonally though when you when you're transitioning going back to the 70s to the 80s and you were fiddling and you started to do the routing and you you were going with the single single hum what was it that even triggered that to start exploring those new tones from what you had been so accustomed to for for so many years well part of it was what i what i said that that guitar kind of sat around and it didn't have much of a purpose other than being that backup that fender kind of character Mm -hmm. but uh, and i wanted to play it more i found that i liked how the body felt uh you know going to the 355 i loved those big bodies you know they were very comfortable comfortable to sit and play uh, and standing, just something about that body, the way it fit oh. against my increasing stomach. <laughs> so, uh, but the that that other platform, that uh, Fender sort of platform, um, I thought I could make more out of it. You know, I've been listening to Alan Holsworth. I was so impressed with his style, particularly with the vibrato and uh, and his left hand, the way his left hand had worked. Um, and I wanted to sort of get into some of those moods and mm-hmm. tones that uh, that this provides in your playing. Um, and it just seemed like such a smart thing to do. Sure. You know, to create that thing that I, that I was really looking for. You know, they're all tools, right? You know, we love them, we collect them, we hang on to them. But at the end of the day, they're just a bunch of tools and they do different jobs. You don't use a screwdriver for what a hammer is going to do. And all, all, the, all the guitars have their own characteristics and, you know, one to the next will always have something that's very, uh, well, not very different, but, but is, is different. You know, it all comes down to this and every player plays, you know, you can have the same amp, the same guitar, but, you know, five guys, it'll sound different just that's because the, of it, yeah. the way you pick and the way your, your left hand works. Uh, so this was just another platform. I love the, the way the necks feel like these necks, when I had got the prototypes, I was so pleased because they feel great Mm -hmm. for me. They are just perfect, you know, in, in the way my hand processes the movement up and down the neck and then the back of the neck is great. You know, I don't, you know, there's not a lot of varnish or anything. No, it feels on, good. It's like it. an old friend. Yeah, it's like an old friend. Yeah, exactly. I've I've taken the finish off a couple of guitars right down to the wood. Oh yeah, yeah. You see some it's a risky four, proposition. Like Four hundred, <laughs> yeah. a couple times to clean yeah. it up every once in a sure. while. But there's something about the way that 
raw wood feels in my raw hand. Yeah. And it feels really, really super connected. I think that's the best I've heard anyone articulate <laughs> what makes playing guitar so seductive. Yeah. Because when you try to explain it to somebody, it goes beyond the 12 notes and the chords and everything else. It's really, there are times I'll find myself sitting on a couch with an unplugged electric and just that feeling of it against me. Yeah. You know, it's almost like a security blanket. But to talk about how a neck feels where the rubber meets the road, as it were, um, that was very eloquent. Yeah. We're, yeah. All, we're all, you know, it doesn't matter where your skill lies. We're all artists yeah. in one way or another. I'm not. And if, well, <laughs> if, if you put all the same paints in front of an artist on the same canvas, all of them are going to be to paint something different. Right. Mm. And that's, it's not so different for music. I think that's the same way that we all approach it. We all leave our mark on the way we, we interface with this instrument. No doubt. And you mentioned the neck. Is that a C, a D? Is it kind of in between as far as the shape is? Oh, it's more of a D. It's more of a D. Than, or, you know, close to an I. <laughs> 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 no, it's, uh, it's uh, for me, I just, I love this feel of, yeah. of this neck. I'm not such a C neck guy, yep. the big round necks. I have big, yeah, you got meat hands. hooks, yeah. So, yeah, it's fine. I can play it. And I appreciate them. And, you know, I, uh, again, you know, they're different instruments. They do different things. You right. play them differently. Right. When the neck feels a certain way, you play it differently sure. than this. But no this for for agility and speed, this is the perfect neck. So when you were even met, uh, you know, meddling and fixing met with the different parts, uh, components of the originals, the neck itself, you had even gone through some different iterations, right? Like shark necks was... Yes, that's right. Something yeah, that so it him. started with a with just a standard uh, uh, fender on yeah. that first one. Um, I was just really interested in getting that humbucker in there yeah. and then the Floyd Rose. Uh, so I had a stable vibrato system. Um, but when we moved on, we used other components. We used the shark neck and, uh, and it was nice to s check out like different necks before we got into that whole project. Yep. And at the time they were, you know, they were one of the dealers that they just did everything catalog, uh, so they did all kinds of components and necks and pickups and all that stuff. So it was a, a nice way to work in developing the uh, the Hentra, which became right. this. And they had no label on the headstock. No label on the headstock. Drove people nuts. Hence, so what did you do? It became the Hentor Sportscaster. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened? You're like, oh, no. yeah. So Hentor. Yeah. Uh, uh, Peter Henderson uh, was the engineer, produced, co-producer on Grace Under Pressure that we used. And uh, he, he was quite a character. And, you know, we have nicknames for everybody. Mm. I'm Lurks, Getty's, you know, Dirk or Deke, and Neil was Pratt. And, you know, we've all had many, many <laughs> nicknames over the years. And, and we always assign nicknames to everybody that we're spending time with. And Peter... Uh, became Hentor. <laughs> <laughs> but it was because he wrote, it was the way you you read his last name, Peter Henderson. It certainly looked like that. Oh, it looked like Hentor yeah. when he wrote so his number. So it was perfect. Down. Hentor. It sounded like a it robot. It sounded like Bytor. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And yeah. then Sportscaster. And then Sportscaster. You're just having you know, fun. Just to take off on, you know, all the other broadcasters. Could and you like print it in, and like cut it and... Electroset. Electroset. Yeah, I, I put it on in Electroset. <laughs> Which is <laughs> high end. the way to do it. High yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which brings us to this now. So obviously this is an homage to that guitar. Yes. Um, with some clear, you know, distinct advantages now. We've got a much more modern take on it. Uh, what do you feel is the most up-to-date thing on there that kind of brings it to where you are now versus what you would have picked up back then? I think when uh, Mojotones put the pickup together, yeah. they've brought something else out of the pickup. Uh, a little... I guess more clarity. There's lots of uh, output on this pickup. Um, it, to my ear, it just sounds a little smoother. Mm -hmm. um, you know, otherwise, we've sort of covered everything, certainly everything I wanted. Like, this is a small thing, flipping the input. Uh, I mean, for anyone that doesn't know, this is what it looks like when it's Bert, reversed, it's when, when it's in there. It's, it's an Audi. It, yeah, it's an Audi, <laughs> exactly. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, but, when you're plugging in and back then using a cable and switching guitars, sure. you want it, you know, something boom, 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 instead of fiddling around and fishing for that, yeah, that little hole to get in there. Um, you know, we went with the two different vibrato systems, uh, the Floyd Rose and um, Vega, and the Vega, and I love this Vega. 
the fact that the strings go straight through, there's, there's nothing holding things down, creating more resistance, you know, it stays in tune much better. I mean, I mean, it's great to be able to lock it down uh, and then just fine tune it when you, when you need it mm -hmm. on the Floyd Rose. But it's also nice to just pick up the guitar, go like this, and, go. and, and, and off you play. Up. Yeah. Yeah, just run. It goes a little loud. I find that just one little pull up, yeah. and it gets everything right back in. Yeah, so, that Hendrix trick, you just yank yeah, it back. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's fair to say we were giving the thing a workout right before oh, the interview. Sure. Yeah. You should yeah. have seen yeah. the Vega tram was concerned, and it holds yeah. really well. Yes. And he would room, run right at it from across the room. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Nothing. Yeah. We got all the blood The removal of the string tree as well, right? Sorry? The rem no string tray. That's right, yeah. So that, that makes everything, like I said, less resistance. Uh, going Staggered to the tuners. Yeah, to the tuners. The, the fretboard's got a really nice... It's beautiful. Yeah. To me, it's nice flattish. Yeah, uh, it seems feel. like a spill for speed, but you, yeah. know, you could dig in too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is, I mean, you could do, I, I could see you doing, if you were to do a show with one guitar, you'd be pretty set with that. Yes, I would, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd be very set. It has really everything that mm -hmm. that uh, that I would require. Mm -hmm. Ebony and Swamp Ash is the combination between the fretboard and the body, which mm -hmm. is also held true with the Sportcaster as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when you were kind of, again, tweaking these iterations that ultimately even led up to the incarnation of this particular model, would you keep them consistent between the colors, like red, black, and white. If you ended up switching a humbucker out on your white, would you then go, I got to do the same thing? Or were they kind of uh, their own yeah. tools? They were, you know, the black one started out with, with a standard humbucker that we had uh, in our inventory on, on the road. Yep. It was just, a, you know, a, uh, a Gibson humbucker. And uh, and that that suited my purposes, but I wanted to get something more out of it with the, with the hand tour. Mm -hmm. Hence, we went to the Bill Lawrence with a higher output pickup, and that was the case with both those, the white uh, with the white one and the red one. Okay, and did you find it challenging at all when you had to balance the volumes between the higher output uh, Bill Lawrence and then the two singles? Not really. I mean, the two singles. They have their own character, and it's so bright, mm. and it cuts, and it's clear. Whereas the the Bill Lawrence is denser and uh, more squishy sounding. Yeah, I never found that an issue. And soon after, you know, it followed up with two channel amps and separate amps and effects rigs, yeah, and, and yeah. all of that stuff. So yeah. then you could separate all the roots going to everything. Sure, I have to ask. The pickup selector. I mean, so many, so many of us are used to S-style guitars with the blade switch. Any particular reason of putting a Gibson-style toggle on there? Or? I was just used to it. You know, that's what I yeah. uh, always used. I found this the configuration here. I just wanted a little more space, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, moved the toggle. That, the toggle's fine if you're used to it as a, a Fender player, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was never really like that. So I found it cumbersome and clicky and this you know it's here and i'm used to a nice big yeah uh you know knob on it um and again just to get things out of the way here easy to get easy to get to it while you're playing rather than trying mm -hmm. to manipulate it here and getting getting in the way of the pots as well. so it was a very conscious decision it wasn't just you yeah. know this was really well thought out as to how no, you wanted it to work absolutely yeah. if i was going to do it what's the ultimate it's not just throwing a pickup in how do I make it more uh, useful to me? Little things like the input jack or the the jack input, and uh, and then moving this stuff. And again, so when we're up, we have neck and middle. I'm sorry, neck, then uh, neck and middle yeah, is middle, right? And then just correct humbucker is ends up being bridge. And your volume and your tone was that always the case too? You just wanted really simplicity, volume yes. and tone. I mean, I saw them roll the tone off. Maybe never. So, uh, we could so just rip that right you off. You could just rip that right <laughs> off. Or, you know, change a channel on TV or something. Yeah, yeah. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Make an espresso yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah, so it's really just about, about the, the tone uh, or, or the volume pot. So it's funny. We, we were researching the Hentors, uh, the history and all the different iterations that came up. And I'm just kind of curious if you even recollect that the write-ups that you would have when you would describe your hentors <laughs> like you would hit like a grace under pressure uh, tour book 
and you'd hit like your rig. And I'm like, oh, there's gonna be great stuff in here. And what do I see? It's like a story of a guy with, <laughs> he was hairy and it was like, he, it was hysterical. He was covered like, in this, green Not, not fur. exactly yeah. what I was uh, yeah. expecting to come across yeah. when I was diving Sometimes in. Sometimes you get bored of doing those sort of things. So <laughs> you like to liven them up a little bit. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, that's funny too, because I, I think that this kind of guitar too, especially the way you've got it laid out, it brings out certain aspects of your playing. And there's certain things that I've, when I hear you play, um, and I think this is a great compliment, is that I know it's you almost irrespective of the era of what you're playing, but there's a lot of facets to your playing that are unique. They're simple, but if you were to cop your style, you need to have that. Is there something in your repertoire that you feel people never really picked up on that you would define as something that is indicative of your playing? Or? Because I have a couple, but I don't want to bore you. Okay, yeah, I don't know. It's always hard when, yeah, because it's so subjective. But Mm. I think where I'm at now, currently, uh, we've been working on a couple of a lot of different projects. But this Envy of None project is one that I really am enjoying so much. We're on our second iteration of uh, of the project, and I'm loving the material. It's great. It's definitely Envy of None. But it's gone up a step or two, uh, and uh, it, as it's developing, I'm really, really excited about it. What it's provided for me was an opportunity to expand on what I can do with the sonic character of the instrument and how to make it so unlike a guitar. And this is what I've been having so much fun with. Mm. You know, different tunings, weird tunings. Uh, Lots of effects, uh, creating uh, almost synth-like sounds mm-hmm. uh, on a guitar, and I would say probably fifty or sixty percent of the stuff that you hear on on the Envy of None record that you are sure are keyboard mm-hmm. uh, synth sounds are just guitar, you know, manipulated in a certain way. That's really a lot of fun. It's super creative. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really fun to dig in and go down that rabbit hole. Sure. Because it is a very, very deep rabbit hole. You can spend. Oh my God! Yeah. A little, you know, juice to start, <laughs> and then and you're you gone. Go. You're yeah. you're gone forever. Uh, and I just find it so exciting. I'm not really sure what that is. I, maybe it's because I've just played guitar for 40 years and uh, and very traditional in what what I did, my own style, and all of that yeah. stuff. But to now, in these last 10 years, to go in a different tangent. That's and with nothing to prove. Yeah, I just yeah, want to do it. Yeah, I just do it for fun. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's See, for me, not for the money. <laughs> I loved your incorporation, not just of how your sound evolved, but I mean, I would always listen to that. There were certain upstrokes you did on your playing that were always there. If you you'd miss it if you didn't do it right, and your use of harmonics, use yeah. of suspended chords. These things where everybody can rip ar- arpeggios at a million miles an hour, and we know you can shred. But it seemed to me you made this conscious effort to fill the sound without plotting over everything else. Yeah, like in that. In that particular three piece, yeah, uh, with two of the greatest uh, rhythm section players ever. Yeah, you're spoiled. Huh? Uh, yeah, so you know Neil was an extremely detailed, very active player, and Getty is a very, very active bass player with one finger. With one finger, I can't yeah, believe that. Uh, and uh, I mean, his style of playing—it's amazing when I try to get into his head when he's building his arrangements and I can see where he's going with things and, mm-hmm. and how he sees the connection with the, with the drums and the rhythm section. It was so active. I had to do something about the rest of the sound. Sure. And generally, I, the way I looked at it was I need to fill it out as much as I can. How can I do that if I play a chord like this? If I play that chord, well, those strings are ringing out. It gives me some, some sound in the mm-hmm. background when I'm moving. Uh, so that was the challenge for me to always do those sort of things. Parpeggios, same thing, delay, chorus, just creates almost like a second tracking sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Always looking for ways that I could fill the space in service of the song because those guys were pretty active players all the time. And that's a great point because in so many other bands and, and bands I've been included, most guitar players like to assert themselves as the one making as much sonic mayhem as possible. And it seems to me you knew your lane you knew where you wanted to fit within something, and then you knew where to back off, which is just as musical as what you play. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that 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 kind of was the answer I was looking for. It seemed yeah. like that was a, a again a very conscious decision. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was I was aware of what I needed to do 
to make it the best. Right. And sometimes that meant just laying back and checking your and ego. keeping yeah. it simple, especially when it's super busy somewhere else. Right. There's always a place where the guitar comes back in and does a thing. For me, my soloing was my you know opportunity to stretch out and and still be uh, creative. Uh, and I tried to be very different um, when it came to soloing. It was it was absolutely a different state of mind when we came to that during oh, recording. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you know, I like the fact that that my soloing, I I think, uh, is quite emotional. It's very cinematic. Uh, like light, uh, some solo in limelight, for example, is 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 simple, but it's dripping with all the emotion that I wanted it to have mm. for that song and what that song is about, the great loneliness about of being, you know, on this pedestal that people put you in that you're, you don't feel like you're, you're on. And it's an infringement on so many things in a person's life. We can see so many celebrities, you know, out there that <sighs> yeah. deal with this crap all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes to the point of killing them. And, uh, and I wanted that solo tip feel a little bit of that, that, that yeah. loneliness uh, and uh, uh, un unbalanced kind of feel. It's a very vulnerable solo. Very vulnerable. Yeah. Which is scary to do. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. I Which mean, is probably what made it so gratifying in, in hindsight, I would think. Well, yeah. I had a great platform. The song just sure. sounded so great. And that that uh, the, the arpeggio bridge section, which was the bass for the solo, was a perfect platform to play on. You know, it was very soulful. So to just weave in and out of it was uh, was really uh, was really great, R really a good good feeling. And the setup that we had, we had the amp outside in not far from here in the studio, uh, in the Laurentians in the winter. Was it blasting? Were you loud? It, it, uh, I was. I don't know. I, I don't know if it was overly loud or anything, mm -hmm. but it's the sound was echoing off the. You can the, feel it. There's the a lot of resonance to that solo. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the studio was on a lake. And on I think they had about 10 acres, so there were no other houses around. And that, that just went across the lake. And I'm getting goosebumps thinking about when yeah. we actually set up for it because we thought, hey, this would be kind of cool. Let's put an out, out, amp outside in, like, minus 20 degrees <laughs> weather and record yeah. for a few hours sure, to see not? what happens. Yeah. And, but it's exciting, you know, to always come up with these crazy ideas when you're when you're There's a certain amount of innocence to it as well. It's like, hey, let's see what happens if we put this frog yeah. in the microwave. You know, it's just, yeah. it could work out and it might yeah. not be. But yeah. uh, it certainly worked out there, yeah. you know. And, and it seemed like you guys made a, a real effort to to evolve in terms of how your sound, you know, came around. Like for me, yeah. you know, we were talking about, there's probably only one other guitar player I can think of that we go, that's the Hendrix chord, that F sharp, but you were just, <laughs> I mean, that's the Lifeson chord. And I know you probably go, ah, whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, anytime any of us do that, we're like, it's almost like you're paying homage. To that. Yeah. And did you stumble upon that? Was this just like, this will be a great opening chord for Hemispheres? Or was it just like, I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, it was part of... It's so thematic. Yeah, you know, there were other songs that we wrote in the bar days mm. where I used that chord. And then it's just nice to have those... And get all those open strings. All those yeah. open strings. Mm. And it's like, you know, doing all that alt tuning without having to alt tune. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. You know? Yeah. So your solo album, Victor and even Envy of None, I mean, those are, again, you're kind of like a chameleon. You have so many different styles that you like to get into. How do those approaches that you've even kind of just shared with us on some of those other pieces translate into those eras or like the approach even now, you said you're in like a second, I think you called it a second phase? Iteration, yeah. Iteration. Like, we're, the second album. album that we're So you're working on a second doing, yeah. album. What, what approach styles do you, have you kind of changed? Do you still take the same? So there, it's, uh, hmm. Going back, doing Victor, uh, you know, I was the sole writer. Yeah. It was a solo project. Yeah. I, I did every Different. aspect of it, produced it or engineered it, uh, everything. Um, the writing was pretty straightforward. You know, I, I kind of got ideas and worked them out. And then I worked with some other musicians and we fleshed them out. And lyrics were difficult. I'm not a lyricist. Mm -hmm. That was the difficult part. But the recording I did in my house at the time, I had a, a studio and that was off an office. And the office, I had a, a mic panel in the office. So 
could have all the drums out there and amps and sure. all that stuff. And it was just such a tiny budget and a, a small project. We had, I think, eight tracks total for the drums, unlike Neil, which was yeah. like 38 <laughs> tracks or 40 <laughs> tracks of, That's like Ringo of drums. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So that was cool and a bit of a challenge. You know, you got to get everything happening right because you can't go in and, you know, fix something individually. So, uh, and then recording, you know, pretty straightforward, a, cu a couple of amps that I was using, mics. Uh, what did you record, Victor, too? Was it, was it, was it digital tape? Was it tape? Was no, it, it, it was, uh, no, it was um, my, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, ADATs. Oh, the ADATs. Yeah. So what? Uh, At least to say that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was all to ADAT. Once... I finished recording everything. We used four machines. I had a 32 channel uh, Mackie console. Okay. So that was that was the platform. And then once I got into the studio, I transferred everything to uh, uh, two inch, and then mixed with uh, on the on the on the two inch. Okay. Yeah. And so now you go to Envy of None, and it's just so Envy of None because of, of the pandemic and all the lockdowns and traveling. Maya lives in, uh, or lived in Portland, Oregon. Great voice. Uh, oh my God, she's so amazing. Uh, she, uh, we could only really share files. So that was the way we worked. We had an essence of an idea and then we, it would go around to everybody and everyone would slowly build up until we had a good bed track. And then you got into the serious recording. With Maya, I developed such a, in, interest, interesting relationship with her because when I I got such inspiration listening to her voice and I would do guitar parts based mostly on on that what I was getting from her and then we it, it would go for the next round and we'd get to her and she'd say I love what you did the melodies that you brought out I'd never thought of them or heard them I'm going to redo my vocal because I oh, want to cool. start so we started dancing with each other yeah. in our recordings, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it wasn't just one off or, you know, a return and then that's it. We would go back four or five times on, on some of the songs and they would just get more and more internal and uh, connected to both our energies. It was really fascinating. She's coming up uh, next month to do some vocals here. Okay. Uh, or sorry, in Toronto. So uh, it'll be the first time we've actually been in the studio together in four yeah. or five years That's awesome. i was gonna ask that yeah. you know because yeah. i mean collaboration over sharing files is one thing and especially when there's so much give and take but to have somebody in that room and to look them in the eye to see them you know going for that note and everything yeah and just the fact that you still find it so satisfying this many years in is it's got to be really cool i love it yeah i love it you know when it's nine years uh just over nine years since the last date that we did the sure. tour ended um and for the first few years i have to admit i was just kind of floating around, playing golf, and thinking, is this it? This, this is it for, for me, golf for the rest of my life? And Which is not a bad way to go. I mean, no, in, in one way, yeah. Then Neil got sick, and, uh, and then it made, difficult, it made it difficult to really do anything musical or, or plans. We sort of worked on the NVM Nun thing in the background. Uh, actually, um, it was Andy Curran who brought the, the project to me, he was working on some stuff and just asked as a favor if I would throw some guitars uh, on it. So I just another great bass player. Plug in, in, yeah, right. Just used plugins, mm -hmm. made it super simple. Nothing, I you know, I didn't even correct stuff. I just threw it down. So he had a reference. Then he met with Maya in a talent contest, mm. and <laughs> uh, he was the one that was interviewing her and. Uh, and his advice to her was, you know, you should get together with somebody and and do some more writing. I think that'll help you to I know develop. a guy. And she said, "Well, I checked you out. How about if we write a song together?" <laughs> and well, you know, Andy old. laughed and said, "Okay, well, all right. Well, we'll I'll we'll send you something and yeah. we'll see how how it goes." And so he sent her a track. This is a track we already did with a different singer, mm. but he sent her the track. And when it came back, he sent it to me and said, "Al." You have to listen to this. You're not going to believe her voice. And uh, I said, okay, send it. I'll have to listen when yeah, I get around yeah, yeah, to it. Right. And I had to listen to it. And I said, okay, send me all my guitar stuff back. I'm 
deleting everything. We're starting over fresh because this is something really, really special here. And then we started seriously building up the whole Envy of None uh, project and sent more stuff to her and it just came back more and more great. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. And to see this energized oh, yeah. about something, again, you know, it, that's the beauty of it. Like you said, picking up a guitar, kind of, it unlocks that part of you that's still a kid. Yeah. And so to have a new version of an old friend yeah. to make new music, I mean, personally as a fan, I'm, I thank God that you're doing it. I mean, it, just to hear you playing right here is, is a treat, uh, even not, you know, plugged in. So it's great to see that you're going to continue to play and that yeah, Envy of None is, is an ongoing venture. Well, that's one <clears throat> ongoing venture. I'm involved in a couple of other things, but this one gives me a great deal of satisfaction. Uh, and it's such a departure for, for me as that guy from Rush, you know, doing this sort of material that's a little more... Uh, almost EDM mm -hmm. kind of, um, and with her voice and, uh, and the fact that the sounds are all kind of different and it's very trippy and rhythmic. So can you talk about the rabbit hole you went down though with the pedals? It sounds like you kind of went into the synthy territory. So, I mean, that I'm imagining that you're, you know, well, got the stock room of like options yeah, that have, you're constantly experimenting with. Yes, lots of pedals. I have my own pedals there that are being released now. And, it's a uh, famous plug. Fame, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By door. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, over the years, 40 years plus, I've been collecting so many things. Yeah. You know, I had the first chorus pedal that, that Roland put out, I think the CE1. Yeah, you know, you're it correct. was. You know, it was the big, heavy yeah. metal. But nothing metal sounds one. like it, though. Yeah, but nothing sounds like it's it. It's ridiculous. I know. I still have it at home. It's <laughs> in my studio. And, uh, electric Mistress. I have the original Electric, electric Mistress I bought yeah. back in 1971 or something. Oh, you still got them, huh? I still have it. It sits right by my... Um, Your bed. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my other stuff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so, uh, you know, and it's fun just plugging things in and cranking knobs and seeing where it goes. And what scientist. Yeah, and then also with... Uh, you know, all the, all the plugins that are available as effects now. So it's, it's, it's almost limitless. It's, it's almost too much. It really is. Yeah. But again, it gets back to the point of how you guys are creating this music. I mean, you know, without a good song, it doesn't matter what bells and whistles you put on it. You know, if you're, you're really getting right. off on that, yeah. everything else is gravy. Um, yeah. And you can hear that. And again, it still sounds like you, even though I wouldn't say, well, he, that's the guy from Rush, as you put it. I, I don't necessarily hear that. I think this is an, an evolution of of your style. Yes. I hear it. I mean, yeah. I hear me sure. in, in, in it. Uh, but it's maybe a little a little more difficult to find. But it's, uh, you got to keep going. And, you know, once Neil uh, passed, I don't think I did very much for a year. Mm. And then I got into being certainly more active. And that's when this level of uh, Envy of None came along. Uh, so it was the perfect timing for me mm -hmm. to dive into a, an interesting project. And to flex that muscle again. Flex the muscle and realize that this is who I am. And uh, trying to do something at this stage in my life that's, that's different just for the sake of being different, it's not really interesting. Mm. I can do so much to keep myself engaged and satisfied with this. You know, I don't have to look for something else. It's, uh, it takes me, it's like an airplane or a car it takes me to amazing places. Mm. Yeah, I guess beautiful. it's like that for all of us, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. Like all There's not a day. I mean, you might go maybe give it a day or two and say, I just need to get it out of my head. Yeah, and you sure. always come back to it, I do anyway, completely re, you know, re-energized. Yeah. You just never get it out of your system, which is thankful. And, and, and yeah. I'm so glad that you got to work on this and bring this to us. You know, we're really excited to sell them and, and to have them on our, our sites and, and to see how they do. I know the fans are going to jump all over it. I mean, there's forums set up of people yeah. geeking out over every every aspect of that guitar. Yeah. Um, and we're excited to bring that out yeah, there. It's well, amazing. I think everyone's yeah. going to be very uh, happy. Oh, for sure. Happy with it. I don't see how they couldn't be. Yeah. It really is great. There's a few scratches on that one, though, so we're going to have to... <laughs> um, okay, we'll mark it down 20%. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, thanks so much for coming out and sharing. Oh, it's with my us. pleasure. You it, know, it thank you. It's been a great uh, working together on this for a couple of years. I, um, I'm so proud of the fact that it's, it's a Canadian company, and you know, Godin has a long history of great quality. That was really paramount for me. 
So here we are at this day Getting with ready all to launch. these babies ready to go. Put it in yourself. the hands of a number of guitarists. It's yeah, great. yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. And check out Lurk's Limelight Guitars over at AmericanMusical.com. There it is. There's the chord. There's the chord. I can die now. <laughs>